I don't know if this was the uh, passage you were expecting uh, for President's Christmas, but we're still in our uh, series on doubt. And as I thought about doubt and uh, specifically the promises of God, and uh, also thinking about our graduates going out in the world, this seemed like a really good passage uh, for us uh, today. And I think uh, in many ways a really relatable passage uh, as well. I have a conviction, and perhaps you do as well, that a promise made should be a promise kept. Uh, I believe this as a father. In fact, when, I was, when my children were small and they would ask if they could have this or do that, I said what maybe your parents said too, we'll see. Uh, I didn't want to make a promise I wasn't sure I could keep. I wanted my word uh, to be as good as my bond. Which explains why I was so disappointed one day um, in Center City, Philadelphia, I saw that the Civil War Museum was closed. And it was a, a small worry because I had promised uh, my oldest daughter that sometime I would take her to see the head of Old Baldy, General Meade's famous horse from the Battle of Gettysburg. That may not appeal to you, but she was excited about it. Uh, I discovered that the museum wasn't just closed temporarily, but permanently. And I had done something I promised I would never do, and that is make a promise that I ended up being unable to keep. Now, Kirsten and I worked it out. Alternative arrangements were made, and I still don't really feel good about the fact that I didn't come through on the promise itself. A father should keep his word. This is a bedrock principle of our faith. Our father has promises to keep, which thankfully he is absolutely committed to keeping. Indeed, our God is committed to keeping them all the way to the cross. And when we doubt this, as we sometimes do, we lose the assurance of our salvation. Now, this kind of doubt is partly what Sarah's story is about. Uh, you picked it up from uh, the scripture that was read. And let me just say, we love you, and we know this is the end of the semester, and it was hard to remember everything. So don't worry about that. Uh, I know it's tough to be on the spot uh, the way you were today. But you were reading along, and you were attending to the scripture, and you got the details uh, of the story. It was a hot day. Abraham was sitting outside his tent. He was under the oak trees, and suddenly these three visitors showed up. Angels, the Bible calls them elsewhere. In this passage, one of them is called the Lord. Abraham bowed down to greet them. He welcomed them in the ancient style. Sarah went off to bake bread. Abraham killed the fatted calf. He came out with curds and milk. Um, there was generous hospitality. Now, the most important thing to know about this man, Abraham, as you, as you may know, is that God had given him some very precious promises. He would be the father of many nations, all the nations of the earth, all of the nations represented here this morning, so many of them, maybe, maybe as many as 50, all blessed through this man, Abraham. God made the promise and then he took his own sweet time to fulfill it. Uh, at the time of Genesis 18, in a sense, he hadn't kept his word at all. The years passed by. Abraham turned 70, 80, 99. Sarah wasn't getting any younger either. They had celebrated her 89th birthday. They had no son to call their own. And it, it seemed humanly certain they would die before they ever saw God fulfill the main promise he had made to them. That's the backstory. Now, uh, visitors to Abraham's tent came, they spoke, they brought a message from God, they, they inquired, where's Sarah, your wife? Um, evidently, their presence had something significant to do with her. In a, in a sense, she was the main recipient of this message. Abraham said she was inside the tent. The spokesman gave a simple promise. I will surely return to you this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, 
will have a son. And then you have this dramatic moment um, which, in which Sarah, she's been listening at the tent door. She's so old, the Bible expresses it in a beautiful way. We would, we would refer to something more scientific like menopause. The Bible says it in a beautiful way. The, the way of a woman had ceased with her. There was not a chance on earth she would ever give birth now. And so when this stranger came and said that she would become a mother, Sarah laughed. After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have this pleasure? Make no mistake, she knew that what was said was God's promise. She had heard the promise before. One of these messengers is called the Lord. She knew God would, had said he would make her husband the father of many nations. She had prayed for the promise to be fulfilled. And when that didn't work, frankly, she blamed God for failing to keep his word. I wonder if you have ever had that thought. You thought God had promised something to you and you weren't seeing it in your life. That's the way that Sarah felt. And then having blamed God, she started coming up with her own solutions, her own ways to make life work. She had said a few chapters before this, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. And so she offered her servant to her husband as a surrogate. The whole thing was disastrous in every way. And after everything that had happened and everything that didn't happen, I think you can understand why Sarah, when she heard, or you might say overheard, someone say that she would conceive and bear a son, she laughed. And not a merry laugh either. It had an edge to it. The sarcastic words she speaks reveal the doubts of a heart that was hardening against God. And recognize everything that in this moment Sarah doubted. She doubted the truth of God's word. She doubted that he cared very much about her situation. She doubted that he would ever answer her prayers. All of these experiences made her very skeptical about what she had heard about God and specifically what he had promised to his people. And she surely is not alone. Most of us, could it be all of us have life experiences that cause us to have spiritual doubts, maybe sometimes to be a little sarcastic about biblical Christianity? We, we didn't get what we hoped for, what we prayed for. God promised to be with us, and we didn't really experience his presence. We still felt alone. There were things we had and kind of led to expect would be true for us if we followed Christ, and they never seemed to happen. We, we had a promise of holiness, and we were still struggling with a sin. We found ourselves waiting for God to answer a prayer that eventually we gave up praying because it was so discouraging to pray and never get an answer. And some of our doubts are really like Sarah's. They are doubts about the main promises of salvation. What about this one, the promise of God to raise us up to everlasting life? That seems pretty improbable, maybe even impossible. Some days when we die, will we really live again? Well, anyone who has ever found it easier to doubt than to believe should see how this story continues, both in the passage that we read and beyond. The implications of which are not just for her, they are for the whole world, they, they are for us. Before Sarah became a believer, which she did, and we'll talk a little about that, God called her out for being a doubter. And it was important because it clarified for her where she was spiritually. Rather than letting her kind of drift on somewhere between faith and unbelief and maybe trending towards unbelief without ever making a clear spiritual commitment, the Lord confronted her skepticism. He said to Abraham, knowing full well that Sarah was listening in, 
Why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? God is calling to the forefront, not just the skepticism, but the underlying reason for it. And Sarah did what people usually do when they're caught in some kind of compromising position. She said, no, I, I didn't laugh. She tried to deny the whole thing. She was afraid, which of course was a lie. And thankfully the Lord refused to let her get away with it. No, but you did laugh. Yeah, she did. That's where this passage ends, at least in the way that we read it. Where do you stand with respect to the promises of God? Whatever you do or don't believe, recognize the Holy Spirit knows all about it. You can't just hide in a doorway somewhere and think that God doesn't know where you stand. If you are strong in hope, God sees your faith. He will call you to depend even more upon his promises. But if you have your doubts, your skepticism is no secret. The criticism you offered of a biblical truth, the scornful comment you made about a classmate's spiritual zeal, the private curse you uttered against something that God did or didn't do in your life. The Holy Spirit knows all about that. And far from wanting to cover those things up, God wants to bring them out into the open. In fact, he would like to do for you what he did for Sarah and clarify what you don't believe and why, so that in time he can turn you into a believer by the work of his spirit. Sarah's unbelief was very simple. She didn't believe it was possible for God to keep his promise. She didn't believe that God could do, as it were, the impossible. And bringing that secret doubt into the light of day so that it was there was an important step in her coming to faith. Yesterday I was talking to one of our graduate students, a marvelous believer from mainland China. I, I asked him how he came to faith, and I almost, and I wish I had afterwards, I almost asked him this question. When you started to go to that Bible study, which you went to because you wanted to work on your English, but you also knew that Christianity was wrong, what was the thing that made you the most angry? I, I almost asked him that question. I asked him instead how he came to faith, and the first thing he said is, well, to be honest with you, when I first went, I was really angry, and I was like, I was going to ask that question. What confronted him was the call of the gospel to forgive enemies, which he knew was against everything he had ever experienced in his culture, and he knew it was impossible for him to do. That was the place that he realized that God was calling him to do the impossible. Clarifying that started him on a journey that led him to faith, and we see something similar here in this story. And in a way, to really understand what happens to Sarah, we're going to have to look very briefly backwards and forwards. This is a story with a prequel and a sequel. Very briefly, the prequel is in the Garden of Eden. And I think Genesis is written in a way that helps us see the connections. Both stories, the stories of Eve and Sarah taking place near a tree, involving a deception in which someone is hiding and God calls it out and starts asking some pointed questions in both stories, including the promise of a blessed birth, the serpent crusher in Genesis chapter 3, the nation's builder in Genesis 18. And interestingly, so interestingly, the word Eden shows up here in Genesis 18. Sarah doubts if she's going to experience the joy of motherhood. She uses the word for pleasure that's a form of the word for Eden. There's a little hint or a little clue. And what the Bible is showing is that God is starting to make good on his promise of reversing the curse. A child is promised. Now here's another child promise. Something bigger is happening than simply a surprising birth announcement. God is working a saving plan. And then you see it in Genesis chapter 21. Sarah gives birth. The Bible says the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And let me just say to you, if God has said something to you by way of promise 
a day will come as it did for Sarah when he makes good on it. And you're able to say, yeah, this is as the Lord had said what is happening to me. And the Lord, it goes on to say, the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. It's repeated for emphasis. God did what he said. He made good on his promise. It's underscored for us. And so it was that Sarah did conceive and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken. That was the proof for Sarah. That's the, that's the story. But there's also a sequel you turn to the Gospel of Luke, there's, strangely, another old couple unexpectedly expecting Zechariah and Elizabeth, their long past childbearing years, and yet they too, a son is born, a child is given. It's the forerunner of the Savior. It's the forerunner of a more astonishing announcement. An angel comes for a visit. It's in the lake country. And it comes with a life-changing, world-saving declaration. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign forever of his kingdom. There will be no end." And what happened to her was not merely improbable as it was for Sarah and Elizabeth. It was truly impossible. It was something only God, the Holy Spirit, could do. The ancient prophecy was fulfilled in Nazareth and then in Bethlehem. A virgin conceived and bore a son. She gave birth to God the Son incarnate. Mary received the promise. It was something she could hardly believe. She had a question. It was just really an honest question. How? How, <laughs> how could this happen? And the angel's answer was simple. The Holy Spirit is going to do it. He's going to come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that was all that Mary needed to, to hear. She knew that for God, the impossible is Possible. She didn't doubt. She believed. She didn't resist. She surrendered. She didn't scoff. She worshiped. Three mothers, three babies, one story of salvation in Jesus Christ. I suppose Mary is the best model for our faith. But don't be too hard on Sarah, uh, partly because there's a lot of Sarah in you. She didn't believe at first, she doubted, but eventually she became a stronger believer because of it. Do you remember what the, the book of Hebrews says about her? Hebrews chapter 11, the faith hall of fame. We read there that by faith, Sarah herself received the power to conceive even when she was past the age. Why? Because she considered him faithful who had promised. You don't see that when she's in the door of the tent. But the Bible says she got to that point. And do you remember what Sarah called this baby? She named him Isaac, which is the Hebrew word for laughter. And she gave a little explanation. God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. Who would have said to Abraham, this is what Sarah said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, and yet I have borne him a son in his old age? I think it shows Sarah's ability to laugh at herself, which is one of the best signs of spiritual and emotional health. And she invited everyone to laugh, including us. I imagine her growing in her laughter over time, maybe, maybe smiling the night, that she and Abraham shared relations, chuckling. The first time she realized the reason she'd been so irritable is because she was having morning sickness and she couldn't help but laugh when she felt a little swish inside her and realized new life was moving inside her womb. What we know for sure is that she laughed out loud when this child was born and wanted everyone to laugh. You know, the Bible says that no matter how many promises God has made, promises of forgiveness, promises of healing, promises of God's provision and direction, 
Promises of perseverance, even through something as simple as the last week or two of the semester. Whatever promises God has made to be with us in all trials, no matter how many he has made, they are yes in Christ. And when you believe that, sometimes you just have to laugh. Doubters may scoff at the promises of God, but believers will have the last laugh. And, and I believe in a way with Eve, with Sarah, with Mary, our mothers in the faith, we'll spend the rest of eternity laughing about the time when we didn't believe that God would come good on his promises and then remember again that he did every promise he made in Jesus Christ. I feel a hallelujah coming. Do you? 